Hello, good morning, welcome. Um, I apologize that I'm probably going to cut at least a little bit into everyone's lunch, thanks to uh, Linux on desktop. Um, but I will try to get through this as quickly as possible and still leave room for questions that anybody may have at the end. Um, so welcome to Real World Threat Intelligence, um, where we're gonna take a look at some of the threats that users sometimes face in the wild. Um, so before I get into uh, some of the threats that I've kind of gotten to see out in the real world, um, I want to tell you a little bit about my background because it is really non-traditional and that's actually been quite an asset for me. Um, I don't come from a traditional computer science background at all. I actually got into security through teaching uh, workshops to activists. Um, and I got into that through emergency medical response. So it's been quite an interesting path to kind of wind up here on the stage in front of you. Um, and there are a few takeaways that I have from both of these backgrounds that I want to share. Um, so activism is where I learned a significant portion of my threat modeling, um, both how to do it and also how to talk to people when sometimes they think that their threat is one thing, but their threat is actually something else. Um, I work in the United States mostly, and a lot of the activists there have a tendency to think that their greatest threat is the FBI. The FBI probably does not care about their bike-powered kale farm, but local law enforcement might. Um, and the way that you address both of these threats is going to be a little bit different, so figuring out how to get other people to threat model appropriately is also one of the things that I've gotten from my activism background. Um, I've also developed a really good understanding of operational security and tradecraft through both my own activism and helping teach other activists how to do things ideally without landing in prison. Um, and uh, yeah, that's not something that a lot of people um, who are coming from CS backgrounds generally really get uh, to develop an understanding of, especially tradecraft. Um, so I also come from emergency medical response, and this has been really, really, really useful to me because I already have a really great understanding of triage. Um, if it's not bleeding out, then it can probably be managed, and if somebody is bleeding out, then it can still be managed, it just needs to be done a little more quickly. Um, this is translated to a background in incident management as well. Um, and it's given me the additional perspective of the fact that I'm used to people who may or may not die if they're not treated correctly. Um, computers seldom have outcomes that severe, uh, even when they're malfunctioning horribly. So it makes it really, really easy to maintain perspective and keep calm. Um, and then the last thing that I've really taken away from my medical background is learning how to develop a diagnosis before giving treatment um, so that I can be sure that the treatment that I'm suggesting actually fixes the problem. Um, and I'm actually going to keep going back to that point quite a bit this afternoon or this morning. Um, so diagnosing the problem. Um, in medicine, the first rule of diagnosing a problem is talk to your patient. Your patient probably knows things that you don't know. Um, you might be looking at somebody with a dislocated shoulder going, oh my god, that's not supposed to be like that. And your patient may turn to you and go, oh no, that happens every Thursday and sometimes if I look the wrong direction. So sometimes your patient actually has a much better idea of the failure modes that they're experiencing in their bodies. Um, and it turns out that users are also going to have a pretty good idea of failure modes that they experience in their everyday lives. Um, we, we also want to kind of figure out whether there are pre-existing conditions that we should know about. Um, for example, I warned Raphael that probably it was going to take a little bit of extra work to set up my slide deck to display correctly because I'm a Debian user and audiovisual issues in Linux are um, one of the things that are as persistent as death and taxes. Um, so are there any pre-existing conditions we should know about is one of the things that we kind of factor in when we're starting to try to diagnose people. 
Um, and then one of the other things is, have we seen something like this before? Have we, in our experience, seen circumstances similar to the ones that our patient is presenting with? And does that inform our treatment of them? Um, it might, it might not. So the first rule of medicine is do no harm. Um, and that means a whole bunch of different things. Um, but it mostly means we don't want to prescribe treatments without having a really good understanding of what the actual problem is. We don't just want to treat surface level symptoms. We want to actually fix the problem at its cause. Um, and again, that means also talking to your patient. It means letting them know if there are potential problems that they may face in pursuing the treatment pa uh, path that you're recommending to them. And it means talking them through their options and helping them decide what works best for them. Um, because your patient's care and your patient's quality of life are the most important things in medicine. So when we're developing a treatment plan, um, there are a couple questions that we want to ask. Uh, one is, are there a bunch of symptoms to address? Um, and do we want to prioritize treating some of them over others? Um, next is, are there potential contraindications for the treatments that we are recommending? Um, so if we're thinking of pursuing medication as a treatment for a problem that a patient is experiencing, does that medication interact with other things that that person is already taking? Is it going to cause side effects in them that may be worse than the condition that we're actually trying to fix? Um, these are, these are all questions that we kind of want to ask if, if we're trying to figure out how to treat a problem. Um, so another thing that we want to kind of figure out is do some of the recommendations that we're making need to be prioritized over others? Um, if we're looking at somebody who has multiple issues going on, uh, we want to make sure that we're treating the most critical ones, and that sometimes means leaving the less critical issues untreated. Um, and it also sometimes means revoking treatments that were previously in use so that we can treat the more severe issues. Um, one of the things that comes to mind is that same situation where we're potentially prescribing medication to somebody, but it interacts poorly with a medication that they're already taking. At that point in time, we're going to want to kind of look at the, the problem that the medication they're already taking is treating the immediate problem that we're trying to solve by prescribing additional medication and figure out which of those is more important to fix because maybe we can't fix them both. Um, and then the most, the two most important points are here at the bottom. Um, can this plan actually be carried out? If we're prescribing solutions for our patients that they can't actually implement, then we're not really helping. We're just kind of adding to the problem a little bit because we're giving them hope and then not giving them the support that they need to act on it. Um, and then also, will this plan result in a net improvement to their quality of life? Um, this one's huge, and it translates almost one-to-one -one into security practice as well. So understanding threats, we want to talk to targets. We want to know what they think their threat model is. Sometimes they're wrong, but more often than not, they have a really, really good understanding of what they're afraid of and what they want to protect and from who. They probably have a much better understanding of that than we do because we've just met them and they've been living in their bodies their whole lives. Um, we want to understand how the threat that they're under is impacting them. That doesn't just mean how it could potentially harm them in the future. That doesn't mean what um, attack surface is open. We also want to know how the threat is impacting their mental health, their daily life, because a lot of the threats that normal users face cause them to feel like they can't live their lives uh, the way that they want to. And because we are prioritizing their quality of life, um, that's a question we want to figure out. Um, we also want to know if there are other immediate threats that we need to take into account. So if somebody is coming to us about one problem, we want to get a good idea of their total threat landscape, not just a good idea of the circumstances around that one problem, so that we can factor that into our decision-making process. Um, and again, have we seen anything like this before? 
Um, this particular question has come up really, really, really often in my own practice as an independent consultant. Um, and it's actually helped quite a bit because I have a tendency to get people who come to me panicked because their phone is doing something really, really weird. They think that it might be malware. Um, and even in cases where it is, being able to say, hey, this probably actually is malware, but I've seen malware just like this before. This is behaving erratically in a predictable way and in ways that other people have also experienced. You're not alone. You're not crazy and you're not imagining this. Um, so have we seen anything like this before helps quite a lot when dealing with um, users in the wild. Use signal, use torque. Uh, raise your hand if you've ever given this advice to somebody who was asking you for security advice. Nobody in this nobody in this room has said use signal use tour. Does anybody know why I'm asking? Opsec? Because of opsec? Um let's actually let's explore that a little bit. Um when you say because of opsec, what do you mean? Okay. Um, this person over here in the front said that there may be more important problems to address before suggesting signal and tour. And that's sometimes true. Um, this phrase comes up a lot in, uh, in the United States. I've also seen people outside of the US recommending these two tools. Um, it's not inherently bad advice. Uh, recommending signal and tour in most cases won't pot or won't cause additional uh, threat to your user or the person that you're trying to help. But it's important to think a little bit before you recommend tools. Um, we don't want to recommend security tools to anybody if we don't know how those tools are going to impact their lives. Um, some of the cases that we're going to kind of think about in a couple moments here um, are actually some cases where this might be actively dangerous advice. Because while using Signal and using Tor under normal circumstances is probably benign at least and may actually help, there are a lot of use cases where advocating the use of specific security tools may be enough of a red flag to um, the threat actors that people are dealing with uh, to actively endanger them. So we just want to make sure that we're not recommending tools without really, really understanding the circumstances of the people we're recommending them to. Um, so securing targets. This slide looks really familiar because it's really, really similar to um, our um, treatment plans for, for medical patients. So how big is the attack surface, right? We want to know the full landscape of what they're facing, not just the one issue that they maybe have come and uh, presented us with. Um, we also want to know, they might think that their phone is vulnerable, but we also want to kind of get an idea of how vulnerable their everyday life is, maybe other devices that are in their possession. There are a bunch of things that we want to take into account here. Um, we also want to know whether addressing some threats is going to make the target more vulnerable to others. Um, so if we're recommending that somebody start using Signal and Tor, for example, um, but they're living somewhere, if, let's say we're, we're recommending somebody use Signal and Tor to um, help them fly under the radar of surveillance, state surveillance. Um, if that person is also in an abusive relationship, that advice might actually be endangering them because if you're dealing with intimate partner violence in your everyday life, the appearance of security tools on your device may actually trigger your abuser to become violent. Um, so that's one of the things that we want to consider. Um, we also want to think about whether some recommendations need to be prioritized over others. Um, so whether some threats are posing a more clear and present danger to our users. Um, we want to ask if the target can actually carry out this plan. Um, telling our users that they'll be totally secure if they just use tails might sound like really good advice, except that they're probably not going to actually do that. 
um, which makes it potentially less than useful. Um, and finally, will this solution result in a net improvement to their quality of life? The idea is not to make them jump through a whole bunch of hoops for like a marginal increase in quality of life. We want to make sure that we're actually improving their day-to-day -day experience. Um, so let's talk about threats. These are a few of the threats that I have encountered in the wild. Um, stalkers, they tend to be fairly persistent, um, but are usually relatively low skill level. Um, overbearing relatives, snooping bosses, other generally creepy people who are kind of in your everyday life and maybe want to know a little bit more than you want them to know, or maybe want to know things that they have no business knowing. Um, my dating life is definitely not my boss's business. Um, intimate partner violence. I have had the opportunity to work with a lot of people who are facing um, this particular threat. It is a really scary one. And there is no one single solution to that problem. Um, so every time I work with somebody, I have to actually kind of figure out a, a specific and targeted solution for them and their circumstances. Um, state repression. I have had the, uh, I guess, I want to say privilege, but I shouldn't have to work with activists from all over the world um, because people should be free to express dissidents. Um, but I, I have gotten to work with activists from all over the world. Um, and I've learned a lot of really valuable lessons. Um, again, this is another threat model that requires plans be tailored pretty specifically to each individual target's path of life. Um, but it's a really interesting problem to solve. Um, and then finally, actual freaking Nazis and other um, non-state political adversaries. Um, and this one's kind of important for a couple of different reasons because these adversaries do go after political activists, but in a lot of places they also go after people who are just normal human beings whose lifestyles they maybe don't agree with. So a lot of people who are not even necessarily terribly politically engaged, but happen to be people of color or transgender people or queer people or disabled people, actively face threat from a lot of these um, far right wing zealots who just don't think that they deserve the right to live. Um, and if they happen to be outspoken, that threat is uh, increased. Um, so what all of these threats have in common is actually quite a lot. Um, a lot of the tactics that they use are fairly similar. They all use open source information um, on their targets or open source intelligence on their targets to kind of build a profile of that target's path of life so that they can figure out how best to uh, mess with it. Um, they all use fear as a means of control. Um, they all really, really negatively impact the quality of life of their targets. Just being targeted in this way is enough to make people think that maybe they can't or don't deserve to live the life the way that they have been. Um, and that's a really, really detrimental effect that is often overlooked. Um, another of the things that all of these problems have in common is they can't be technologyed away. These problems are going to persist because they're human problems, and we can't actually solve them with computers. We can use computers to help in some cases, and we can certainly use computers to reduce attack surface for these people, but we can't computer the problems away. We have to actually solve them in human ways. Um, and finally, all of these problems result, uh, require dynamic solutions tailored to the individual target's needs. Um, because again, we want to make sure that we're recommending strategies that people can actually implement and incorporate into their lives um, so that they use them and so that they get the security benefit from them. So uh, let's talk a little bit about stalkers, creepy bosses, uh, overbearing parents, just general snoops, right? Um, they are usually pretty unsophisticated. There are a few exceptions to that rule. We've certainly seen a rise of stalkerware in the last five years or so. Um, can you raise your hand if you've heard the term stalkerware and know what I'm talking about? Okay. 
So awareness is also spreading. That's really exciting. Um, for those of you who don't know what I'm talking about, um, Stalkerware is a class of remote access tool um, that is usually deployed to a device via either physical access to that device or a phishing attack. Um, typically, it comes from somebody that the owner of the device knows and trusts. So it might be a significant other. It might be a parent. Um, it's frequently sold as tools to monitor uh, your children's device usage. Um, but by allowing that to kind of persist, we're also allowing these tools to be used in other potentially even more nefarious ways. Um, and I say potentially because even using these tools to monitor your kids' devices teaches your kids that surveillance is okay and good and that they should accept it. And that's definitely not a message we want to be sending. Um, but so we're seeing a rise of stalkerware, um, and that is one of the technical advantages that some of these particular threat actors actually do have access to. Um, a lot of these particular threats have direct physical access to their targets, um, whether because it's a stalker who has established this person's pattern of life and is starting to show up places where they think that person may be, or an abusive spouse who lives with this person, um, or a parent who, you know, maybe only sees their kid a couple times a year, but asks them to bring their computer because they've, you know, bought them a new hard drive or something. Um, they, they frequently have physical access to both the target and their devices, and that can be a real problem. Um, they also all have the potential to pose significant risk to the target's physical safety. Um, so with all of these threats, we're looking at a, p a potential risk of bodily harm to our target if they're handled incorrectly. Um, and that's something that's really important to keep in mind when we're making recommendations. Um, these particular threats probably can't be eliminated, um, but in a lot of cases they can be mitigated so that at least our targets have a chance at living a happy, fulfilling life. Um, and that's going to be our goal here, right? We can't make somebody stop obsessing over someone, but we can make it a lot harder for them to impact that person's day-to-day -day life. Um, so a few of the things that I would recommend, actually, you know what? Let's, let's not look at that yet. Um, I want to know what you would recommend if a friend came to you and said that they had a stalker. What's the first thing you might suggest? Set your accounts to private. Yeah, that's a really, really good place to start. Um, making it harder to track you on social media is a really, really great place to start. Um, what else would you recommend? That's a really, really good suggestion, and I'm going to go ahead and repeat it. So um, who to talk to in case you're having trouble and organizing spaces for you to be in to talk about problems, uh, spaces that are safe for you. Um, anything else? Keep records. Yeah, that's actually a really good idea, too. Um, and I like that you phrased it that way. And um, so keeping records is really useful. Um, because it allows us to consider how we might want to use documentation later, but it doesn't necessarily uh, imply or require our getting the state involved in our problem, uh, because in a lot of cases that's not necessarily useful. Anything else? Okay. So one of the things that we are going to do is, like this gentleman over here suggested, make sure that our target has a support system. We want to make sure that they have friends who are checking in on them. We want to make sure that they have friends who are going to notice if something goes wrong. Um, we want to make sure that they have people that they can rely on for support, because all of these threat actors use isolation to increase attack surface. Um, we also want to make sure that they establish escape routes and have safe spaces set up for themselves. We want to make sure that they have contingency plans and duress phrases that they can use with their trusted parties, with their support systems, so that if 
you have a, a weekly check-in set up where you say, hey, are you going to be at yoga class on Wednesday? And the person who's being targeted says, no, I have a scheduling conflict. Maybe that's a good clue to you that they're not actually doing okay and that immediate action needs to be taken. It's a totally benign message, but it's one that you can kind of establish beforehand um, and use in the event of an emergency that won't trigger um, violence, hopefully, from, from the person that they're facing threat from. Um, so that's a way that we mitigate threat without causing suspicion. Um, other ways that we might want to think about mitigating threat without causing suspicion are maybe instead of recommending that they use Signal and use Tor, we want to start getting them to use Facebook secret messages, which is a weird thing for a privacy advocate to stand up here and suggest but Facebook is a messenger that millions and millions and millions of people around the world use every freaking day. It's not a security tool, and it actually has an end-to-end -end encrypted messaging option built into it with ephemeral messaging so that those messages can be deleted. Um, so it's, it's not actually a bad suggestion to make in this particular use case. Um, and that's one of the reasons that I say that we should start thinking about all of the problems that somebody is facing before we recommend tools, because sometimes the problems that they're dealing with in their lives call for really unconventional security and privacy tools. Um, and then, as the gentleman in the back suggested, we also want to help them reduce their um, open source intelligence footprint. Um, so locking down social media accounts, maybe developing pseudonyms for using social media, um, there's, there's a whole bunch of different things that we can do. We can also teach them some basic compartmentalization so that they can kind of control which bits of information are linked to which other bits um, to help kind of carve out some privacy for them so that they can help or they can start making plans to, to take care of themselves. Um, state repression. So the first thing I want to say about this is not all state actors are created equally. There is a huge difference between local law enforcement in the United States and the NSA, um, and which of these particular actors we're dealing with is going to pretty drastically influence the suggestions that we make. Um, their objective is generally to alter the target's behavior. Um, so whether we're talking about... Um, state repression in a country where it's illegal to be gay, or state repression against dissidents, or um, state repression against women, all of these things are, are done to people because the government wants them to stop being a problem. They want their behaviors to alter. And so our objective when we're dealing with this is to prevent our, our users from having to alter their lifestyles, because we want to protect that. We want to preserve that. If we keep our users safe, but they have to change their lives in order to do it, the government has won, and they didn't even have to do anything. Um, state rep uh, repression may also threaten the physical safety of targets. Um, it can. This can happen in a whole bunch of different ways. Um, it might mean incarceration. Incarceration is a threat to the physical safety of any human being. Um, if you are in prison, you are being harmed. It doesn't matter if you're getting three square meals a day. If you don't get to do the things that you want to do and have the life that you want to live, that's harm. That, that's not something that is okay. Um, it may also include uh, black baggings, beatings, um, Sometimes dissidents are killed. So there are a whole bunch of different levels where state repression actually does threaten the physical safety of targets. All of them are uh, valid things that we want to avoid. All of them are things that we really want to prevent. Um, state repression can also threaten targets' loved ones. Um, and that's something that there may not be a perfect solution for but that we want to take into account when we're starting to make recommendations and when we're working with our targets to help them build their safety plans. Um, and then finally, they can also threaten the target's livelihood. Um, it's not uncommon for people who are facing state repression to also be blacklisted in their profession, um, harassed coming to and from work. Um, so that's something that's important to keep in mind as well. 
So the first question that we're going to ask when we're dealing with somebody who is facing state repression is NSA or not NSA? These are the two threat models, right? If it's the NSA, um, the other way that I've heard this phrased is Mossad or not Mossad, um, which is accurate. Um, if it's NSA or Mossad, there's probably not a whole lot that we can do to help that person. Uh, we might be able to help them protect their families a little bit better. We might be able to help them come up with an exit strategy. Uh, but there's probably not a lot that we can do to secure our users against those particular targets. The good news is most of the threats that people are facing are not NSA. Um, and if it's not NSA, there's a good chance that we can help those folks at least uh, reduce their attack surface. So again, the objective, our primary objective is to prevent or to protect our user and protect their lifestyle. Um, since them doing the things that they do in their everyday lives is what is causing them to face state repression in the first place, we want to make sure they get to keep doing that thing. Um, we also want um, to make sure that they're do using basic hardening methods on their devices and their communications. Um, depending on where they're living, using Signal and Tor might actually be a great way to help with that. Using Signal and Tor can certainly help people slip through the uh, surveillance dragnet uh, in the United States. In other parts of the world where using security tools is a red flag that kind of draws the eye of Sauron onto you, um, it might be a better idea to recommend things like WhatsApp because it's widely used um, and isn't actually a security tool. Um, we also want to, you know, like I said, tools are going to depend on a lot of factors. Um, another of the factors that our tool recommendation is going to depend on is the technical capability of the user we're working with. Um, if we're working with a normal human being, we probably don't want to recommend that they switch to running Linux on desktop, um, which I say like that because I've been doing it for a really long time. It's fine. <laughs> um, we also want to start talking to our target about how to protect their loved ones. Um, and this can mean a whole bunch of different things. This can mean getting them to talk to their loved ones about the threat that they're facing and the threat that their loved ones may be facing. And it also might mean creating distance between themselves and their loved ones for their protection. Um, it's going to it's going to depend pretty widely um, based on circumstances, but it's a conversation that we should be having with people that we're trying to protect, um, so that they can decide what's going to work best for them. Again, we're going to try to reduce their open source intelligence footprint. Um, this is more because we want to protect their non-relation loved ones. Um, so we don't want to make a really, really clear map of what their social network looks like. So we're going to go ahead and help teach them how to compartmentalize and, and reduce their social media presence so that it's not evident from looking at their Facebook who their three best friends are and who matters most to them outside of their immediate family. Um, so that's something that we're going to go ahead and do. Um, Miscellaneous political adversaries, which are people like actual heckin' Nazis um, and other people who hate fun, um, they probably don't have the same resources as state actors, but sometimes they will actively attempt to leverage some of those state resources. Um, we've seen a lot of doxing in the United States where people have taken, gone to great lengths to de-anonymize um, individuals captured in photos at various demonstrations and then pass that information on to law enforcement in hopes of uh, law enforcement seeking prosecution against them. Um, so while a lot of these miscellaneous threats don't necessarily have state-level resources, there is a lot of collaboration between the two. Um, at least in the United States, the government frequently does very, very eagerly accept that um, help that they're receiving and does go after um, left-wing act activists. So that's something to keep in mind. Um, we also see a lot of uh, miscellaneous political adversaries targeting people's livelihoods, targeting their families. Um, it's usually done a little bit differently. So where 
State actors may um, threaten incarceration or other physical harm to someone's loved ones. Usually, um, the kind of random people who hate fun and, and political uh, speech will do things like um, send harassing mail and phone calls to people's families. Um, which is still really scary for the people on the receiving end of that and still something that we want to help them avoid. Um, and we also see them doing the same uh, with people's employers, calling their bosses and trying to get them fired, um, which has happened to me, and it's really not fun to deal with. Um, so they use general bullying tactics. So the first thing we're going to do here is try to help them reduce their open source intelligence footprint because this is the primary attack vector that a lot of these people have. Um, this might mean removing pictures of their face from any public social media sites as best they can. Um, it's definitely going to include locking down their social media profiles. It may involve choosing to use a different name so that their legal name is not associated with their political activity in ways that these particular threat actors can find. Um, and again, um, compartmentalization, like we were talking about before, is going to be really useful in this situation, perhaps even more so, because the government probably knows who you are and who you're related to, but randoms on the internet might not. Um, and again, we want to make sure that we're supporting targets and maintaining their lifestyle. These folks come after all sorts of different human beings, and we want to make sure that people who are being targeted because of the circumstances of their birth have the right to continue being exactly who they are without harassment. Um, so what can we do? I'm really lucky because I get to work with a lot of the people facing these threats directly, and that means that I can help them figure out plans to secure their lives and go about their business. But that's not true for everybody in this room, and that doesn't mean that there aren't things that every single person in this room can do to help. Um, so one of the things that we can do is we can start thinking about security like healthcare. And when I say that, I don't mean like American healthcare. Um, Right. Security is for everyone. It's not just for people who can afford it and are gainfully employed. Um, so we can start taking preventative measures to help minimize the frequency of emergencies. That means making sure that the code we're pushing is actually secure and not full of bugs, um, which can be later exploited. It also means listening to our users about their needs and their concerns. And I'm going to say that again. It means listening to users about their needs and their concerns. It means actually believing people when they say that the product that you're developing endangers them in some way. They might not have a solution for how to fix that problem, but they might have ideas on how to mitigate it, and it's worth hearing them out. Um, the only way to do this is through robust testing um, and actually engaging with users on a regular basis. Um, we can also get details before recommending strategies and tools so that we're making the best recommendations and the recommendations people can actually implement. Um, and we can be good stewards of user data. Um, the EU is definitely taking a wonderful step in that direction with GDPR, but we all have the ability to kind of push for better regulations around user data all over the world, and we certainly have the ability to push internally within our own organizations for better security for user data. Um, and the last thing on here is treat your users with respect and dignity. Users are not the weakest link in, in security. Users are actually part of the security solution because again, they know what their threat vectors are. They know what their attack vectors are. They know what their attack surface is and they know how you can help them reduce that. So the last thing that I want to ask is, because I'm a person who's coming from a non-traditional background, and because I've spent all of this time telling you that you need to talk to users and you need to listen to users, I want you to remember that every single person that you meet, every single day of your life, is somebody that you can learn something from and somebody that you can teach something to. That doesn't mean every single person necessarily wants to have that interaction with you, and that's okay. But I think that if we start treating each other this way, we're going to see a lot of the social problems that we're facing in technology start to melt away. Um, 
So please, if you take nothing else from this, take this home with you. Uh, and finally, if you want to get in touch with me, here's Twitter, email, my blog. Um, the blog is not, in fact, malware. It's right there in the name. I'm super trustworthy. Um, if anybody has any questions, now is a great time. Thank you so much. <laughs> Hi, I have a question. Since you're somewhat of an expert and something happened in an embassy in Turkey, would you have been able to tell that person not to enter this embassy? Oh man, I have so many thoughts on that and it's a really complicated question. Um, I would say that probably if you're facing that level of threat from a state adversary, um, going into their house is maybe not the best idea. Um, that said, I don't think anyone thought that they would do that there in the embassy because as a state actor, being like, oh yes, this person that we didn't particularly like wandered into our embassy and didn't walk out is not exactly subtle. Um, so I, I would definitely recommend that you not just walk into your adversary's house, but also um, I understand why that person did. Anyone else? Any more questions? Yes. Hi. Uh, I was wondering, the advice that you gave in the last slide, I, I'm aware this could be a whole separate talk in and of itself, but how would any advice for convincing like product organizations to take that advice? If that makes sense? Um, it's hard. <laughs> Um, one of the things that I can recommend doing is the thing that I'm doing right now. Um, I actually hate giving talks and I'm terrified of being up on stage, but I'm doing it because I think that pushing the narrative that we need to start listening to users is really important. Um, so I would definitely suggest that that's one way to, to do that, but also just kind of like presenting it in a way that makes them think that they've come up with that idea themselves is another great way to kind of help get better adoption of that strategy. Um, so that might be another way to, to think about approaching it. Very cool. Thank you. You're welcome. Any, Anybody else? Any more questions in the room? Let's say people want to do more work like you do and they come from a traditional security background. How do they find their space to participate, to help out? How do they participate? Take it from theoretical to practical uh, work. Yeah, um, that's a really great question, and I'm really glad you asked. Um, one of the recommendations that I would probably make is to start looking for organizations who are working on projects you really, really care about and offer to plug in with them. Um, a lot of nonprofits don't really have... Uh, great security teams working with them. Um, so that might be a really good first step. And usually if you can kind of get a, a foot in the door helping out in these spaces in that way, you can kind of figure out where your next steps might be. Okay, more questions? Yeah, I have a question. Um, you talk about the people you work with. How do they find you? How do people that are in these situations, how do they find somebody like you to help them? So a bunch of different ways. Um, I am a really public person. I have made it really, really easy to contact me. Um, my Twitter DMs are always open. Uh, my email address is published on my Twitter profile. Um, and then I do a lot of writing as well. So I've written for publications that have fairly wide readership on some of these issues and made sure that um, anyone reading it kind of had a way of contacting me just from the article that they read as well. Um, and I've also done some work with a couple different NGOs to get put in touch with people. So a whole bunch of different things uh, work. Yeah, I'm spe specifically thinking about the people you're saying that can't contact. How do, you know, how, how do people that are really in a difficult situation that anything is flagging something up, how do, how do they find 
help. I think that's where um, building those support systems comes in really handy. Um, so making sure that people aren't cut off from their support systems is something that we want to push so that we can just be there even for our friends who are facing some of these issues. Um, and if somebody who's directly under threat isn't able to reach out to me themselves, maybe somebody who's in their support network can kind of give me or someone like me uh, an idea of what their threat landscape looks like, and we can kind of work to help develop a plan for them without ever directly communicating with that person who might be put at risk by talking to me. Great. Any more questions or comments? Okay, well, I'm sure you'll be happy to talk to people outside. It's lunchtime. Thank you.